Let's continue looking at shapes with expanded octets. Let's take a look at sulfur tetrafluoride, iodine trichloride, and xenon difluoride. All three of these are molecules where the central atom has an expanded octet. Let's begin with SF4. I have six electrons in the sulfur, seven in each of the fluorines, so that's 28 electrons in the fluorine. So I'm playing with 34 electrons. Sulfur in the middle, fluorine, 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 and fluorine. So I just used eight, so I have 26 electrons left to go. I can put six on each of the fluorines. And if I put six on the four fluorines, well, that's 24 electrons. So I still have two electrons left. I can't put them on the fluorines because they're filled and they can't expand their octet. The only place I can put them is on the sulfur. So you can see sulfur here has an expanded octet, but that's okay. Sulfur can expand its octet. ICL3. Well, iodine is a halogen, it has seven. Chlorine's a halogen, so it has seven, so that's 21. So that's 28 electrons to play with with ICL3. Iodine in the middle, chlorine, 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 bond, bond, bond. Well, I just used six electrons, so that means I have 22 left. I can put six around the chlorines. So that's 18, so I have four electrons left. Now both chlorine and iodine can expand their octets, but we find it's much more stable to put the extra electrons on the central atom and expand the octet of the central atom. So I'm gonna put the remaining four electrons on the iodine. And again, we have five sites around the central atom. This time, three bonds and two lone pairs. The XEF2, we have eight valence electrons in the xenon, seven in the fluorine, so 14, so 22 electrons to play with. Xenon in the middle, fluorine and fluorine, bond, bond. So I just used four electrons. I have 18 left. I can put six on each of the fluorines. So that's 12, so that gives me six left. I'm going to put all six on the xenon, because that's the only thing that can expand the octet. The fluorine cannot. So once again, I have five sites on the central atom, but this time with three lone pairs. All three of these molecules, the sulfur tetrafluoride, the iodine trichloride, and the xenon difluoride, all have five sites on the central atom. They all start with that trigonal bipyramid shape. But we alter them by putting one lone pair on the SF4, two lone pairs on the ICL3, and three lone pairs on the XEF2. When we revisit the FET simulation, we can see that when we have five sites on the central atom, we have that trigonal bipyramid shape. The electron geometry on FET is telling you how to arrange all the electron pairs. The molecule geometry tells you the shape. And when all sites around the central atom are bonds, the molecular geometry and the electron geometry are the same. If I remove a bond and replace it with a lone pair, well, now I still have five sites on the central atom, but it's not a trigonal bipyramid shape anymore. First things first, when you place a lone pair on the central atom, the bond that we replace is one of the equatorial bonds, one of the bonds with the 120 degree bond angle. The reason is, is we know the lone pairs are more repulsive than the bonds. So it's more stable to put the lone pair at a 120 degree bond angle than one of the 90 degree bond angles. With FET, you can choose to have the lone pairs not be shown and just show the bonds that are resulting. And this gives you an idea of what the shape looks like. This is actually one of my favorite shapes in Vesper. This is called a seesaw shape because the seesaw can go up and down and up and down but that is a trigonal bipyramid that has one bond replaced with a lone pair. That is your SF4 molecule. Now, what happens to the bond angles? Well, FET treats a lone pair the same way as it treats the bond, so it still shows you those 90, 120, and 180 degree bond angles. But we know better. We know that this lone pair is a little bit more repulsive than the bonds, so in reality, these bonds are going to be squeezed together so that these bond angles would be a little bit less than 90 and this bond angle would be a little bit less than 120. And the bond from axial to axial 
this straight line would actually be a little bit less than 180. Now let's talk about what happens when you remove two bonds and replace them with a lone pair. We still have five sites around the central atom. We still have an electron geometry of a trigonal bipyramid. If I choose not to show the lone pairs, I think you see pretty clearly what shape we have left. This is not surprisingly called a T-shaped molecule. When you have three bonds and two lone pairs on the central atom. So this is the ICL3 molecule here. And if we show the bond angles, we would expect 90 degree angles because we've removed the 120 degrees by removing two of the bonds around the equator. So we're just left with these 90 degree angles or the 180 degree angle if we were to go straight across. But again, the lone pairs here would squeeze together. So we would expect these bond angles to be a little bit less than 90 or a little bit less than 180. And then if we remove three bonds and replace them with lone pairs, we still have five sites around the central atom. We still have an electron geometry of a trigonal bipyramid. But our molecule shape is a little bit different. I can choose not to show the lone pairs. And you see that we get a linear molecule again. Still five sites around the central atom. But when you put three lone pairs on, they all go around the equator. And that just leaves your axial bonds and your 180 degree bond angle.